Well, good morning and welcome to the city. My name is Pastor Tony. I get to pastor this incredible church here that we call the city. And we are so grateful for you guys who are here with us. If this is your first time here, we want to welcome you and let you know that, listen, if there's anything you need, any questions you have, please ask us. We are here to serve you. And I want to welcome all of our online viewers who are watching from literally all over the world. Hallelujah. We are so grateful for you as well. And we're blessed to have you as part of our family. Well, listen, over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking, um, not really a series, but just kind of conversation, and I've been talking about how we are God's masterpiece. Everybody say, I'm a masterpiece. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, listen, I'm valuable. So, come on, look at him again and say, I'm priceless. Amen. Say, ain't enough money to buy me, you know what I'm saying? I'm priceless, and we've been talking about how the Bible says that God created us as his personal masterpiece. So when he created his best work, his best work was you and I. Now, sometimes we don't feel like we're God's best work, but I'm here to tell you, you are God's best work. He put everything that he had into you. And in the Bible actually says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, and it says, for we are God's masterpiece. And I always say this, if it's in the Bible, then it's true. And sometimes I've got to remind myself that, listen, I am God's masterpiece, that it doesn't matter what somebody else says, what they believe about me. What I need to believe is what does God believe about me, and if he said I'm his masterpiece, well, then you know what? I'm a masterpiece. And the funny thing about masterpieces, and I got this this week, because as you continue to study, God will just open up and open up, is most masterpieces don't make sense to other people, but it does to the artist who created it. So it might look weird to you. It may look like something that you can't understand or comprehend. Like, why, is, why did Van Gogh do it like that? But it's priceless. You wish you had one in your house. Come on, listen, we ought to feel like we're God's masterpiece, that people ought to want to have us around. Like, you might not understand me, you may not understand why I look like I look, dress like I dress, act like I act, but I'm going to tell you this, you want me around. You want me around. But the Bible says that this isn't something that he's just doing now. It says that he created us new in Christ. So the thing about the masterpiece is you were painting with your fingers before you met Jesus. You were a finger painter. Come on, it's cute, but there's no value in it. Right? We hang it on the fridge, but ain't nobody showing up to buy it. Come on. But when you become in Christ, he does a new thing. God isn't fixing old things. He's doing new things. So we got to get rid of the old to make room for the new. So look at your neighbor and say, you got to get rid of the old. See, God's trying to do something new. So we got to move out the old. We got to, listen, you got to start getting rid of some stuff to make room for the new thing because the Bible says he planned to do something with you a long time ago. So God has been waiting for us to become new. So over the last couple of weeks, I've talked about transformation and how God wants to do a new thing. It's not something that he's trying to say like, well, you know, you got this brokenness and let me go ahead and, you know, God isn't doing, he's doing new. He's transforming us, right? You were one thing, now you're something else. But then last week, I talked a little bit about boundaries and how the kingdom of God is set up with boundaries so that we can be free. And how boundaries don't restrict us, they empower us, and they give us parameters to walk in freedom. But today I want to talk about another attribute of God that is an undeniable attribute, which is his power. Today I want to talk about God's power. Because God is powerful. And when we started this church, we wanted to create a place where you could experience God's presence and his power in a safe place. We wanted to create a place where you could see signs, miracles, and wonders, and you could believe for God to do anything. 
And that is how this place got started. In fact, when we first started, our logo said, the city, powerful people, global change. Powerful people who will change the world. So God's got this power that he has. We know God to be powerful. But I want to show you some things today that there is a power that God has put in you that he wants you to access and use. So, so the last thing I want you to do is I want you to just go up there, put up your right arm, and flex that bicep right there, and point to it and say, power. That's that power right there. Come on, look at your neighbor say, that's that power. You know what I'm saying? That's that power. That's that power. You know, sometimes when I'm fooling around with my wife, I grab her by the arm, and she'll flex her arm, and she'll be like, that's that power. You feel that? I say, okay, girl, you've been at the gym, okay? I see you. I see you. So let's talk about God's power a little bit because the power is the, the, the thing that gives us the capacity and the capability to be transformed, to walk in the boundaries, to be free. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 1, the Bible says, and when he, he being Jesus, called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them, what did he say? What did he give them? He gave them power. So he's walk, they're walking with Jesus, but just because they have a relationship with Jesus, he said it doesn't end in the relationship. You're going to need power. So God gave them power. Jesus is like, I'm about to give you power. And, and, and we sometimes get weirded out by the power because we've seen people misuse God's power. And they made it weird. And they made it whatever. But how many of you know when you see the real power of God? Well, my wife last week talked about our middle daughter who had seizures. And we began to pray and fast. And God broke that thing off of her when my wife gave her communion. That was the power of God. There wasn't anything weird about that. It was just power. Come on, everybody say power. So the thing that I love about power is Jesus gave it to his disciples, but it's something that Jesus talked about a lot. In fact, Jesus' last words before his ascension into heaven, after his resurrection, he actually said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, but you will receive, you'll receive what? Power. He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow you to be a witness. So the power allows you to become a witness. A witness in what? In any, in every area you go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In other words, he said when this power comes on you, you'll be a witness of who I am in your city, your nation, and even in the world. Okay? So this power, this power. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse number 3. He said, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. God, when you found me, I was, I was you know, I was a coward. I acted tough, but I really was a coward. You know, I, I did a lot of pretending. I had a mask on all the time. I really was kind of the person who I, I was trying to be who other people thought I should be, but I really wasn't being who I was created to be. You know, I, I, was, I was that guy. And he said, and my message and my preaching were not wise with persuasive words. You know, I'll just get up and just start flapping my jaws, wasn't really saying nothing. Come on, somebody, you know somebody like that. Don't look at them, just you know what I'm talking about, right? And it says, it says, but listen, all of the sudden there was this demonstration of the Spirit's power. And when that power came, he goes on to say, your faith would not rest. The power is there so that your faith will not rest on what you know, but on his power. In other words, you stop relying on you and you begin to rely on him. So when you rely on God and not yourself, you don't have a spirit of fear because it's no longer you walking in your own might and power, your own wisdom or capacity. So when people say to me, I don't know what to say to them, I say just pray and ask God what to say. Get out of the way and allow him to speak through you. Amen? But as long as you try to do it under yourself, there will always be a hesitancy and a fear attached to it because you're limited in your wisdom. 
So we need to allow God and his power to operate through us. Say, I have power. We have power. So, so, he, so Paul was saying, listen, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind physically and spiritually, but now my eyes are opened. And for us here, we want you guys to know who God is in a very real and relational way. We want you to find family and community here. We want you to discover what your purpose is because I told you in Ephesians chapter 10, God put a design and a purpose in you a long time ago. So we want to help you to discover that. But, but then we want you to live in freedom because the Bible says that the Son has set us free, but just because you're free doesn't mean you're walking in that freedom. Everyone has access to power, but everybody's not operating with power. So let's, let's kind of unpack this thing a little bit today, and let's walk out of here a little bit charged up. Y'all ready? Amen. Amen. Well, in Ephesians 1, 17 through 20, the Bible actually says, through the Apostle Paul, he says, listen, I keep asking God. This is a pastoral prayer. This is a prayer that a pastor should be praying for his people. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. My prayer for you is that God's word would come alive in your heart. That when you read the Bible, the Bible would not just be words in a book, but that it would literally come alive right inside of you. That you would begin to see and understand things in his word that you have never saw or understood before, which allows you to get closer to him. And then it goes on to say, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. I'm praying that you will be able to see yourself as God sees you. If you keep looking at yourself with your natural eyes, you'll never meet the expectation that you could meet when you, when you would see yourself through his eyes. God sees you as a masterpiece. Beautifully and wonderfully made. With all of your flaws, those things are not flaws. They are the things that make you unique. And what makes you unique makes you valuable. So here we are. And he says, listen, there's this calling that you have. And this, this calling is in the, the, the glorious inheritance of people. Do you know that the number one Stress in people's lives is not money, but it's other people. Folks be getting on your last nerve. You know what I'm saying? At work, they be getting on your nerves. At home, they be getting on your nerves. Come on. At Walmart, they be getting on your nerves. I mean, we got, listen. And the reason they be getting on your nerves is because the, the devil knows that your inheritance is in people. So if he can separate you from the people, then you'll never receive your reward. See, for a lot of us, we think it's only heaven and hell. But the devil plays for keeps. Once you've made the decision and, you, and he knows you're going to heaven, he'll be like, all right, I can't do nothing about that. But what I can do is keep you from getting your reward. I'm not just trying to go to heaven, y'all. The Bible says that we will steward things in heaven. Listen, I'm working on an inheritance that I want to have when I get to heaven. A reward. Where, where, where the Father says, well done, thy good and faithful. Right? I don't want to just walk in. I want to walk in. I want to be like, celebrate good. And I'm going to be like, come on. Man, I'm going to high five. I'm like, what's up, Jesus? You know what I'm saying? What's up, Paul? Fist bump. I'm going to chest bump Timothy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I'm going all in. But I'm going all in. And, and, and I want the Lord to be like, I got your keys. I'm like, hey. Right? And it's not because. Of anything other than God has created us to want to have dominion, rule, 
See, we get so caught up like, well, you shouldn't be like that, and we're not going to be up there floating around with wings. But we're going to be stewarding things. And I, listen, I want to do that. That's why when he created Adam, he said, hey, this garden, I need you to take care of this. I want a garden. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be walking around in that joker. And I'm going to be naked because my body going to be looking fresh. That's what Adam was like. <laughs> okay, okay, that's too much. That's what the Bible said, babe. I don't know. That's what it, it said when he sinned, he put his clothes on. You know what I'm saying? But I guess there ain't going to be no, I ain't going to have no wife, so I'm going to put my clothes on too. Praise God. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> but what I want us to see here is <laughs> our inheritance is really in people. And I really do pray that God softens your heart to people so that our investment is in people because it's people or through people that communities are really changed. Schools are transformed, neighborhoods, cities. A nation can only be changed by people. So my heart is, is that God would soften our hearts to help us to see ourselves as we are, that we would know we've been called to do something and we're not just here to observe but to participate, and that God has an inheritance in us, and it's a richly inheritance in people. And this power that God has, and listen, it takes power to deal with people. That's why they both start with a P, power in people. Because people are people, and we can't get mad because they're people, right? People sometimes talk to me about our church and the people at our church, and I'm like, listen, man, they're people. Why are you, listen, you want me to talk about you? Because, listen, people are people, and sometimes people are hard, right? Would you guys agree sometimes people are hard? But sometimes people are also amazing. Amen? So, so we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And when, when, we, when we allow God's power to come inside of us, we come alive. And the same power that it took for Jesus to be raised from the dead and to get out of the tomb is the same power it takes for you and I to be saved, to be free, to know why we are here so that we can make a difference for all eternity. And I'm only able to do what I do not because I'm trained. It's not because I'm brilliant, church. It's not because I have fancy words of knowledge or, or understanding, right? Right? It's not because of any of those things. It's only because the power of God is alive inside of me. That's it. It's only that. It's not my wisdom. It's nothing that I bring to the table. It's only him. And I'm telling you, this is a place where God is welcome. This is a church where his power is welcome. This is a church where signs, miracles, and wonders are welcome. And this is a church where changed lives are welcome. Amen? But the problem is, is a lot of us in the room have had an experience with God, but we've also had an experience with God that has left us wondering, is this it? So I got goosebumps one time. One time, I felt like Pastor Tony was talking directly to me. One time, I got emotional and I started crying. But is this it? Is this all that I'm going to experience as a believer in Christ? It's kind of like what I, what I reference or look at as, it's like looking at a picture of a dream vacation. Something like Bora Bora. It's like looking at Bora Bora and you're like, man, it's a real place. And it's like, I'd love to visit it, but I've just never experienced it. I mean, who wouldn't want to be there? And one of those, hut, look, at they got swimming pools in the, the, the hut on the ocean. So just in case you don't want to do seawater, you could just be in your pool in the ocean. But I'm like, man, what kind of place is this? 
It's surrounded by a natural reef that all the water is just that nice aqua green color. If anybody want me to go to try to win some folks for Jesus, let me know. <laughs> I got my passport. But, but isn't it? It's like it's a dream. It's like, man, I would love to go there. I would love to experience this. But I've never, I, I, and, and, and it's the same with God. It's like, I see it's alive in Pastor Tony. I, I see this or that, but I've just never, it's a, it's a dream. It's a fantasy. But God is saying, listen, I don't want you to dream about it. I want you to experience it. But the way that you're going to experience it is going to be through my power. So I'm going to ask you guys to tap in a little bit today to your faith. Your faith. Why am I going to ask you to tap into your faith? Because your faith is the one thing that you get to control. Because if I could simplify the word faith, your faith is actually your attitude. It's your attitude. You get to control the barometer of your attitude. And as your attitude increases, your faith also increases. And when your attitude diminishes, guess what happens to your faith? It also diminishes. So I'm going to ask you now to begin to believe for something greater on today. Jesus actually had this encounter with his disciples in Luke chapter 14, verse number 12. And he said to his host, and I love this. This is awesome. I'm telling you, you got to read your Bible. I want you to actually look at how Jesus talked back in the day. He said, hey, man, if you, if you give a luncheon or a dinner, you, you know, you're you going to do something. You're going to have some food. He said, don't invite your friends. What? He said, yeah, 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 man, don't invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Because if you do, they might invite you back. I was like, well, dang. Jesus was saying, hey, don't invite them because guess what? You're going to have to go back. You got to repay. Now, listen, there are some times when you invite some people over and they come over, but if they invited you to their house, you wouldn't go. Okay, ain't nobody want to be real right there, but you know what I'm saying? You'd be like, you'd be like ah, well, you know, man, I actually, you know, my wife just called. and uh, He said, listen, you might have to go. He said, but listen, but when you give a banquet, so when, you, when you're doing these things, he said, I want you to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And if you do that, what will happen is you're going to be blessed. But why would you be blessed? It's, it's because they can't repay you. Because, see, what will happen is when you can't be repaid by people, then what God does is he goes and makes the payment for them. So when you couldn't pay God to get back into a relationship with the Father, Jesus came and paid what you couldn't pay. So if you focus on people who can't repay, God starts making those payments for those people. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather get a repayment from God than from any person. Because what I need, people can't give me. What I want, people can't put in my hand. What I'm believing God for, only God can do. So I can't be hoping that someone will do it. I need to go to the only one who can do it. Amen? So I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to start having lunches at the church, and none of y'all are invited. Praise God. <laughs> That's what he said. But listen, this is what I want the church to look like. I want it to look like Jesus. I want our church to be a place where we never stop pursuing his presence, where we never stop pursuing his power. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. I don't have time, but they're actually different. Because he gave them the and. That's for another day. And then he says, Then Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Awesome. So his power is all throughout the Bible. And I actually believe that today somebody could get healed. Today somebody could be set free. Today somebody in this room could be completely transformed and have a completely different life from this day forward if everybody in the room could just believe. 
Because God is not a formula where you do this and then you get that or you go boom, 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 and then miracle happens. God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, and that's period. And the thing is, is people will say, well, why do some people get healed and others don't? I don't know. But he's God. He's God. And, and listen, I do know this. I don't understand why he does what he does here, but when we get into heaven, we'll know exactly why he did what he did, and it'll all make sense when we get there. It'll all make sense. Because the Bible says that God is working everything to our good. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, one of my favorite encounters that Jesus has is with this loud, obnoxious dude. Any of y'all know anybody like that? I can be like that sometimes. And the Bible says, as Jesus approached Jericho, Jericho was a place of praise. Y'all remember, they marched around it how many times? Seven times, and the walls came down through a praise. Right? So this is a place that's known for praise. And the Bible says, as he approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. And when he heard the noise of the crowd going past, he asked what was happening, and they told him that Jesus, the Nazarene, was going by. And the Bible says in verse number 38 that the blind man began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, exclamation point. So he wasn't like, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't say it in his heart. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says he shouted. Just in case, he's like, listen, I'm blind and I can't see, but I'm going to make sure you hear. The Bible says he shouted. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I know all these other people are around you, and they all probably need something too. But I want you to know that sometimes it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. So right now, in this, this could be my only moment. The blind man recognized the moment. This might be the only moment that I have to encounter Jesus. You better believe I'm not going to sit here and hope something happens. I'm about to do anything I can to be a part of making something happen. And the Bible said this that the people around the man told him to be quiet with an exclamation point. They were like, be quiet, it's Jesus. They yelled at him. One translation says they told the man to shut up. Shut up. But when they told him to be quiet, he got louder. Come on, y'all got a kid like that when y'all at the store? And they'd be asking for something, and you'd be like, no, nah, man, put that back. And they'd be like, why? And you'd be like, be quiet, because I said, mom. Like, it goes on, and they just keep going. Come on, right? And it says that, listen, he got louder, said it again. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says that when Jesus heard him, he stopped. He was like, what in the heck is going on? And the Bible says he ordered the man to be brought to him. And as the man came near, Jesus asked him. He's like, man, what do you want? And he said, I want to see. I need a miracle, sir. I need you to do something to me that nobody else could do. I need you to change my life right now. I want to see. And you want to know what? Jesus said, okay. Do you know that God wants to do what you're asking him to do? Do you know that? He actually wants to do it. He wants to do it. And the Bible says, he said, all right, receive your sight. He said, your faith has made you whole or it's healed you. He said, you're good. And the Bible says instantly. See, it wasn't, it wasn't a process. He became brand new instantly. Blank slate, instantly. Start over, instantly. And the Bible says the man could see and he followed Jesus, but how did he follow him? Quietly? No. 
He followed him just like he met him, praising him. And all who saw it praised God too, which means sometimes your miracle is, is, is evidence to be a witness in Judea, Samaria. Come on, somebody, so that other people can see what God is doing in you, and then they can begin to lift them up. And when they begin to lift them up, their miracles will begin to come to pass. Because that's what God does, and that's how he does it. So, so the question is, is then what can you do? How can you receive the power so that God can do the miracle? What can you do? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to be passionate. I hope when I die, and I don't want to die right now, Jesus, but I hope one of the things they say about me is that dude was passionate about God. I'm talking about passionate. Like when he started talking about Jesus, something inside of him turned all the way up. He was passionate. We got to be passionate. We got to become passionate. Because God loves passion, and the Bible actually says he's looking for passion. He's looking for it. In fact, in Jeremiah 29 and 13, the Bible says this. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your what? All your what? Heart. Heart is another word for passion. You'll find me when you start to get passionate about me. I'll be right there. I'm looking for passionate people. I'm looking for it. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to be persistent. We can't just be passionate, we've got to be persistent. The Bible said that when he got passionate, the people told him to shut his mouth. They told him to be quiet. But the Bible says when they told him to be quiet, he actually got louder. He got louder. In fact, we see in Luke chapter 18, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they, would all, that they should always pray and not give up. Be persistent, don't give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. He said, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. And it says, for some time, the judge refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, he said, listen. Because this woman keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And then he says, and will not God. So if somebody who doesn't fear God or care, you can move them with persistence. It says, then will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? He said, I tell you, he will see they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Some of the reasons we're not getting what God wants to give us is because we give up too soon. You want God to move in your life in a very powerful and profound way, but you give up so easily. How many of you in here have kids? Raise your hand. Come on. You got kids? Raise your hands. How many, and I want you to be honest, right? You in the church. How many of you gave your kids something when they did not deserve it and they should not have gotten it just because they wouldn't leave you alone. Raise your hand, says every parent in the room. Right? Man, here, shut up. Can, can I get an amen right there? So if we can do that, why are we not doing what our kids are doing to us to God? We're day and night, we are seeking after him. God, you got to do it. You got to save my son. You got to deliver him and set him free. You got to do it with my daughter. Whatever. Like, we are so persistent that God is like, you kidding on my nerves? Let it be done. Boom. Because, listen, y'all, some of y'all good at getting on nerves. 
You know what I'm saying? But we got to be persistent. Say I'm passionate. Say I will be persistent. The third thing we got to do is we got to praise. We can't be silent any longer. The Bible says that Jesus said, I'm looking, or I'm sorry, we got to be precise. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Precise. We got to be precise. So when we're persistent, we got to be precise. Jesus asked the man, what do you want? The man gave him something specific. I want to see. He didn't say, I want to be healed. He said, I want to. We got to be precise. In fact, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and 2, it says, you desire, but you do not have. He said, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Some of us are praying, but we're praying so general that God has, it's like, what do you want? Will you, what do you want? Don't tell me you want a new bike and then get mad at the bike I give you. If you want, like, I want a, I want a Haro chromoly frame, blue bike with a gyro, pegs on the front and on the back, with a laid back seat. Come on, some of y'all in here know what I'm talking about. Like, you got to tell God. What is it you can't just be like, God, I want a bike. And then you get one of those grandma bikes with a basket on it, and you're mad because that's, he said, you just said you wanted what kind of bike you want. God, I need a new job. What kind of job do you want? You need to sit and actually think, what do you want? So that God can help to bring it to pass. The fourth thing is you got to be positive. Come on, we got to be positive. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. But God didn't do it like I wanted. Well, listen, you can take that up with him when you get, when you get to heaven. But you still got to be positive. Mark 11 and 24, he said, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it'll be yours. You got to be positive. You got to, listen, you got to believe that you've already received it. There are sometimes I'm walking around and people are asking me, like, man, you know, you're in a great mood today. And in my mind, I'm just walking in the blessing that I'm already believing God for. Right? I'm walking in. Sometimes I be driving in my car pretending I'm in places in other cities about to go preach the gospel. I'm literally, like, pretending. I'm like, man, I'm in L.A. People can't drive there either. And I'm about to go to preach to 10,000 people, God, and you're about to save 9,999 of them. Because I'm believing. I'm believing. And listen, if you can do those four things, right, if you can be passionate, be persistent, be precise, be positive, then the last thing be really easy, which is you become praiseful. The Bible says after the man was healed, he followed Jesus, praising God. God is looking for you to follow him. He wants you to be a witness for all the people everywhere that you go. The man began to praise him. Philippians 4 and 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, thanksgiving, praise. Present your request to God. God, I'm going to begin to thank you before I ever get what I know you're going to give me. I'm going to be thankful for something that I have not received because that takes faith. There's a boldness attached to thanking God for something that you don't have yet. But I'm going to thank you anyway. God, I'm going to thank you that this church is not a church that is stationed in one city, but many cities. I'm going to thank you, God, for the dream centers that we'll have. I'm going to thank you, God, right now for the communities that we're going to impact. How we're going to be able to do things through those dream centers and ministries where we're going to see people get skills that allow them to do things and open businesses. 
where we're partnering with places like ATEC and we're scholarshipping people to go there so that they can learn how to do those fundamental trades so that they can make money and provide for their families. God, I'm thanking you right now in advance that we're seeing a wave of people coming into this church, but we're seeing an overflow of people coming into our churches in Lake County and in Cleveland and in Cincinnati and Columbus and Dayton. God, I'm believing, God, that you're going to strategically place us all over the world. And God, I'm thanking you right now, God, for the school that we'll have where we will be a, a leading edge, a cutting edge school system where kids will get a high a high class academic education and we will set the trend in the world where we combine academics and athletics together where our kids are are great students and great athletes where we're pushing and we're making a way and we're creating waves because God you're able to do all those things that you've placed in my heart because I'm thanking you even right now for the men and women in this room the future pastors of the city, children's directors, outreach directors. I'm thanking you, God, that you do great things with small people. And I'm believing that right now in the name of Jesus, that God, I'm asking, I'm believing, and my attitude is here. So it won't be long, but it'll be quick. And God, I pray that every person in this room's heart would be open to receive what it is that you're about to do. So God, I'm going to give you that hallelujah. I'm going to be in my office singing real loud. I'm going to be walking around Walmart singing your praise everywhere I go because God, I know what you're capable of doing and I know that you want to do it. So God, there are no limits on you. The only limit is what I have in my heart and in my mind. And God, I pray that my own limits would not limit you. I'm walking in the blessing because I'm a blessed man, highly favored of the Lord. No one or no thing can hold me back because I'm mighty in God. There is nothing that can stand against me, no weapon form that can prosper, but I am a child of the King. I walk in the obedience of a mighty God, a Father who cares and loves for me, who is not ashamed of me, but who has commissioned me, called me, and is using me to make a difference in the world. But it's not me alone, it's you. So I pray that every person in this room right now under the sound of my voice would begin to praise, would begin to believe, would not be silent any longer, but would dream again. I pray that every person in this room right now would begin to allow something inside of them that would be bold enough to believe in the impossible things again. That you would begin to see yourself as a masterpiece created and called by a mighty God where he has put his hands on you and he's using you to do mighty and miraculous things, where you're leading people that you never thought you would lead. Leaders are following you. I see it and I believe it. It's not a Sunday morning experience. It's a global takeover. It's a kingdom advancement. It's a movement. And I'm believing radically for God to do it in you, in you, in you, in you, and in you. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to adjust your faith. Your faith is your what? It's your what? Yeah, it's your attitude, right? So I want you to close your eyes. And for the next 15 seconds, I want you to open up your heart and I want you to dream. If God could do anything through you, I want you right now to imagine what that would look like. Blank slate, new canvas, you and God, and you can do anything. What does it look like? What do the people look like? Where are you?
Come on, dream. 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 Now what I want you to do is I want you to attach your faith to that dream. So if you're ready, you're ready to be passionate, be persistent, be precise, be positive, and be praiseful. You're ready to stop living the same day over and over and over again. And you're ready for God to do something brand new. I want you to slip your hand in the air and let's come into agreement together. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you see every person whose hand is lifted. It takes boldness to lift a hand because right now, God, we're dreaming. God, we're believing in things that may seem foolish if we told it to somebody. But God, it's something you've placed in our hearts. So right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every hand that is lifted, God, that you would stretch your hand down and touch them. You would come into agreement and you would give them precise prayers to pray. You would give them a passion to believe, an excitement, God, that would well up in them that they are seeing it, God, even though they may not be experiencing it yet. God, I pray, Father, that they would remain positive and that when negative things try to come and attach themselves to, to pull that dream down, God, that you would cast those things off. And God, I pray that right now in the mighty name of Jesus, God, that you would put a praise in our mouth, a praise that could take down the walls of Jericho, a praise that could take down the walls of doubt, of fear, of depression, of anxiety, a praise that could take down the walls of divorce, a praise that could take down the walls, God, of, of, of fear. God, I pray that you would put a praise in our mouth. And that when we tell ourselves to be quiet, we would only become more rambunctious. We would get louder. And we would believe that, God, if you put it in our heart, it's because you want to bring it to pass in our life. So, Father, thank you for making us a masterpiece. And, God, I thank you, God, that this church is a church that is for people. It's a, it's a church that is pursuing people, pursuing power. It's a church that won't stand still. It's a moving church. It's a church that has a fire to reach people all throughout this nation and the world. And God, I pray that you would bless these people. I pray that uncommon income streams would begin to flow into their lives. That you would use them to advance your kingdom here on the earth. I speak blessings over them, honor over them, power over them. Give them strategies and ideas to do things. <laughs> I feel like God is about to, he's about to birth some businesses in this room. And, and the business that you're about to birth, God is going to use to help fund his kingdom. And he said, there's going to be more than enough for you, but you have to keep your hand open to give. It's, it's not for you, but you will be blessed. So, Father, I thank you for that right now. I thank you for that. I thank you for what you're doing. And, God, I pray that you would keep our hearts pure our minds clean, and our mouth. God, keep our mouth, keep our mouth full of praise. Praise, praise, praise. Father, I thank you, I love you, and I receive your power in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope the message made a difference in your life. 
Make sure you click the subscribe button. And if you feel like one of your friends could use this message, please share it with them as well. And I want you to know that if you want to support this ministry, you can support this ministry through our giving, which there's a link right below that you can click on as well. But either way, we want to thank you for being a part of our church family. You're making a difference and God has an incredible plan and future for you. So I can't wait to see you next week. God bless you and be the city.